Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to Shakespeare and Company. It's an absolute delight to introduce you this evening to Rowan Hisayo Buchanan, who is here to talk to us about her startling debut novel, Harmless Like You. Buchanan brilliantly weaves together two alternating narratives. The first strand tells the story of Yuki, a 16-year-old loner who manages to persuade her parents to let her stay in New York and pursue a career as an artist while they return to Japan. We follow Yuki on her bohemian adventures through New York in the 60s and 70s with a cast of eclectic characters from friends to lovers. The second strand is set in 2016 and narrated by Yuki's adult son, Jay, who she abandoned when he was two to devote herself to her work as an artist in Berlin. Jay, who saw himself as a happily married man, becomes a father and faces many obstacles, including his own ambivalence towards fatherhood. Until finally, he confronts his mother on a visit to Berlin accompanied by his ailing cat, and things begin to change. Harmless Like You traces us on a journey through decades and cultures, exploring themes of identity, art, belonging, loneliness, love, parenthood, inheritance, abandonment, patterns, and reconciliation, among many more, in a highly original, personal style that feels deeply moving and leaves one questioning the complexities of our own lives in a different way. Rowan herself is from a rich cultural mix of Japanese, British, Chinese, and American. She has a BA from Columbia University, an MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she's currently working on a PhD at the University of East Anglia. Her other writing has appeared in numerous places, from NPR's Selected Shorts to Triquarterly, The Tin House Open Bar, and Indiana Review. Please join me in welcoming Rowan Hisayo Buchanan, who will read to us a little from her new book. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here, of all places, when you're in Paris, and there's so many wonderful, beautiful places to be. So I'm going to start by reading something from the prologue, so you don't need to know anything other than the fact that it's written in the first person, but the speaker is a man, so you're just going to have to imagine that my voice is a little bit deeper. Okay. Harmless Like You. Prologue, Berlin. The small female oblong stood in the shadows beyond the doorway. Sun buttered the sidewalk where I stood, but she was dressed for a colder season. Three scarves wound around her neck, a russet, a cardinal, and a white with scarlet, wa scarlet reindeer prancing along the weft. Guten Morgen, she said. It was the first time I'd seen a Japanese mouth shape the Germanic consonants. My German was too weak to know if her accent held the residue of Connecticut. Did the Saugatuck River flow along her vowels? Or did she speak as if she'd always lived in Berlin's history-scrambled streets? Yukiko Oyama? I dropped my half-raised hand to my side. You're expecting me. I've come about your husband's estate. Come in, my mother said. If she recognized my features, she showed no sign. She walked slowly, taking the banister, and irrational as it was, I wondered how someone so very small could be my mother. Her little hand clutching the iron rail appeared innocent as a child's. Then again, misdeeds don't swell the body. On impulse, I reached out. Her head was turned away from me. Just for a moment, I let my fingertips press into the forgiving wool of the reindeer scarf. Soft, very soft. Quickly, I pulled away. She took off her slippers by the front door and revealed layers of socks. She seemed older than sixty, very spindly. The hair that dipped in and around the scarves was striped with long strokes of white. I'd once wondered what my life would have been like if she'd taken me with her. On the table, where a bouquet might go, a glass jar held a quiver of craft knives? The furniture was paint-spotted, a radiator thumped. 
tea? she asked. Would you like some tea? I nodded. Empty jars filled a large enamel sink. On a hot plate, she set a pot to boil. She coughed. One hand pressed the base of her throat, while the other wrapped around her mouth. The crackling noise, like leaves being jumped on, continued for a full minute. Sick. Talking is difficult. Sorry. Her voice did sound rough. The end of each word scraped away. The folding plastic picnic chair creaked as I sat down. I wrapped my hands around the mug she gave me. It was green tea. The cheap kind that comes in bags and always carries a slight bitterness. Still, the mug was warm in the cold. She left our family, and for what? The shabby room? As I said before, I'm here about Mr. Eve's estate. She looked down, flecks of yellow sleep dust stuck in her eyes. Her fingers tugged at her scarf, like a schoolgirl sitting through a scolding. You were married to him? Yes? He recently passed away? I waited for her to ask what of. She lifted her mug to the side of her face and rubbed it against her cheek. For heat, I assumed? He left you the house you lived in together. I pulled out the papers, pushing them across the paint-stained table towards her. I just need you to sign for the deeds. Do you have a pen? Of course, there'll be taxes. I'd gone over this with the lawyer from my father's firm. But you'll probably want to sell the house. I'd be happy to put you in touch with an agent. So you'll have to sign here and here. She reached into her sweater's pocket and pulled out a black wax pastel. She lined the papers, peering down to read the fine text. She signed her name slowly. Her signature was square, boxy, and careful. She passed me back the first sheet of paper, signed the second, and then stopped, the edge of the pastel still pressing into the page. She stared at her own name. My son, she asked. Yes, I thought. Yes. Yes. Where is he? Okay, so I'm going to skip quite a bit forward in the book, and this bit is in the third person. It's not narrated by the person you just heard. But we're going way forwards, but also back in time. But I, I think you can all follow that. Uh, yay, brilliant. Okay, then. We're going to page 244 for those following in the audience. Um, is there anything else you need to know? Okay, um, Edison is Yuki's husband, and she's pregnant. And the chapters start with colors. Okay. <sighs> 1981, Nezumi Iro. Japanese for gray is usually hai iro, ash color, but it can also be Nezumi Iro, mouse color. Even after she forgot most of her Japanese, she remembered that, perhaps because gray clouds always looked like fat mice to her. But sometimes the whole sky went dark, and then she thought, wolf sky. Edison loved the lump. He loved how taut it was. He was using her ink to trace a spiral over the dome. His black track ran over the nubs where her hip bones had once been and dipped over and under her thighs. His fingers were cold and she shivered, jogging the line. I'm teaching her Zen, Edison said. You don't know anything about Zen, Yuki replied. Maybe not. And he blew a raspberry into Yuki's belly button. Her knees twitched, slamming into the sides of his head. He pulled away, still smiling, but rubbing his temples. What the hell is that supposed to teach him, she asked. Joy, Edison said, and then he stared intently at her belly button. I hope you're a girl. Hope not, said Yuki. She didn't believe that the baby would stick until five months in. She hadn't trusted the acid in her mouth, the swelling of her nipples, or the aches in her feet. She didn't call her mother, but this baby kept on getting heavier. It was then that she started the painting, and she thought of it as the painting. Edison said that after the baby was born, there would be nothing stopping her finally going to art school. He was a partner at the architecture firm, not a junior partner, but an actual partner. He was talented, although when she looked at the thin, ruled lines of his work, all she saw were window bars, dark stairwells winding up and up, 
office mazes for lives to get lost in. But those traps would pay for paints and pads, sketchbooks and professors. Even now, at 29, she could pass for a college student. Before, she w- before the pregnancy, she was often carded. High school kids whistled at her, and even if they thought her strange, so what? She'd always been strange. She was going to paint a bicycle, as the application required. The bicycle store was on the post road, on the perimeter of the town, a place with trees planted in every yard. Ornamental apples hung, glossy and green. Sun sheared off the bright rims of the bike wheels and the steel twists of the bike racks that stood in front of the store. The racing bikes rested poised, their handles coiled ram-like, ready to charge. She wore her father's faded blue yukata. She'd written to her mother asking that it be mailed to her. Her mother had sent three, perfectly ironed. The accompanying note apologized. The better yukata had been sent away to nephews. This one had a hole in the sleeve, neatly stitched by her mother's regular hand. But Yuki preferred it. This way she could wear both of her parents. She craved them more than any food. She wondered if it was the baby wishing for grandparents. The loose garment cut for a man was comfortable in the summer heat. She moved easily in it. She wore white leather sneakers, comfortable for driving, and Edison's blue aviators. She looked like no one normally seen around Westport. But, having no friends in the town, she had none to lose. The boy who came out of the shop was wearing pale jeans, threads curling from a tear in the right knee, and his t-shirt was oil-striped. Can I help you, ma'am? I want to buy a bicycle. For yourself, were you thinking road bike, street bike, what sort of price point? British, Japanese, we have all the latest Shimano gears gears and all our top models. The boy talked fast, pulling at the back of his hair as he spoke, as if willing it to grow. I don't know. The boy wiped a sheet of sweat from his forehead. At the moment, I'm just looking, she added. The boy slouched against the doorframe, watching as Yuki bent down and touched the hot rubber treads. They felt sticky, but her fingers came up clean. At her touch, the wheel began to turn. She pressed harder, listening to the hiss. There was a light cricket-like clicking from the spokes. She worked her way down the line, stroking and pressing, leaning into the whir. Sometimes she stopped a wheel with a dab of a finger. She closed her eyes, listening to the metallic swarm and the sounds of speed. The bikes, locked in place, seemed so much faster than the Honda that Edison had bought her for her birthday. She looked at the car parked in the lot, green and dusty. She rubbed her pelvis and thought about the painkillers in the glove compartment. The boy was still watching her under thin, drooping lids. She bought a red Raleigh. It looked the way bicycles do in dreams, the platonic ideal of a bike. Inside the store, fans thwacked the dusty air. She paid with the card Edison had signed her up for. The boy carried the bike to the car and eased it onto the back seat. She glanced into her rear view. For all the bikes she'd drawn, she'd never owned one. It hadn't been safe to be a little girl on two wheels in the village. She didn't have a precise plan for the bicycle. She just wanted to get to know it, the real thing, not the idea of the thing. Westport was hilly and woody, and the only flat, easy riding strip was along the Saugatuck River. There, the wetland birds pulled grubs from the mud, and the main street sold overpriced silk shawls to the overpriced wives of hedge fund managers. She didn't need a bike to travel along that quarter mile, but this was for art. She removed the bike from her car. The light was low, and the leaves cast mauve silhouette on the a- silhouettes on the asphalt. She leaned on the handlebars, pressing down on the bike. The wheels were firm, with a slight give. Like breasts, she thought. It would be fun to tell Edison that. Shock him. The house was at the top of a short but steep hill. Edison said it was because the churchyard had been built on the hill, either so the souls could be closer to God, or so that the flood embraces of the Sogatok didn't sweep the bodies up and out of the ground. The house might once have belonged to the rector. Regardless, the hill sloped steeply away, and as she unloaded the bicycle, she felt gravity tug the handlebars. She hitched up the fabric of her yukata and swung her leg over the top. It was an exertion, her belly adding an ungainly sway. 
Her left foot touched the left pedal. She lifted her right foot off the ground and fell. Pebbles bit her hand. A dot of blood opened at her knee. The side of the road was still warm from the heat of the day. Gotta get back on the horse, she said to nobody. It was one of those American sayings. She doubted she'd ever ride a horse. This time, she got in two full turns of the wheel before crashing to her right. Blood spotted the yukata, but it was old blood, just the first wound smearing. Again, she got on the bike, and again. Each time, the throb of pain grew, but she stayed on longer. Her balance improved. Slowly, with many shakes to right and left, she made it down the hill. She didn't have to pedal. Gravity did the work. When she reached the bottom, she pushed the bike back up. She wasn't thinking about art or what she'd paint. It took too much concentration to hold each limb just right, to keep her back straight and her elbows level. It was a good feeling. She sweated as she walked the bike back up to the top of the hill. The sun was a lemon drizzle in the sky. This would be her last run, and she wanted to reach the bottom in one perfect swoop. She clambered on slowly. Her body was hatched by cuts and scrapes. The seat vibrated beneath her. Light swirled on the polished bicycle bell. She looked ahead. Loose hair tickled her neck. She was going so fast. And at the bottom of the hill, she didn't stop, but pedaled, chasing the speed. No wonder no one forgot how to do this. The car came fast round the bend. The last sun caught the bright fenders. She braked, she tipped, crashing into the side of the road. A fallen branch smacked her on the forehead. The sound of her fall covered the car's scream, but she smelled the smoking rubber. Edison stood over her. His thin eyebrows pulled together. Jesus! They'd been together for three years and she'd never heard him shout. He handled a bad day at work by walking straight to the shower. Now he was screaming. The bike pressed down on her side and he didn't move to lift it. He stood over her. All the blood in his face had gone to his lips. His cheeks looked almost green. What the fuck is wrong with you? Help? she asked. She thought another branch had cut her thigh. He lifted the bike, flipping it off her. She stood without his help, levering herself on the fingers of her right hand. The palm was cut. She'd been going fast. She stood. One sneaker had come off, leaving her off balance. How could you? he asked. She wished he'd stepped closer. She wished he'd hit her across the face with the fists his hands had already made. She wanted to fall again in one last crash. His pain could move through his hands into hers. They could share it. He took a step backward. He lifted a fist, but his palm unclenched. He pushed back the hair from his forehead. Quietly, he asked. Are you trying to lose our baby? And so I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to hear you reading it. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you um, a bit about your inspiration for the book (laughs) and uh, what gave you the impetus to write this particular story. I read that your mother had suffered from a case of TGA, which for those in the audience that don't know, is transient global amnesia. You may be able to tell us a little bit more. And I was wondering if the fear of the loss of your mother was behind the inspiration for Yuki. I mean, she's too brilliant. She'll give me all the answers. But um, (laughs) so I had been working on another book and I'd laid it all out. And there was a problem with it, which was that You could feel that it was an idea, but it wasn't something that I could feel in my heart. You know, there was infidelity and conspiracy, but it wasn't working. Um, And I was living in America, and I was actually staying with my grandmother um, over the summer when I got a call from home. And it was, I found out that my mother had forgotten where she was. 
and how old she was and what year it was and my brother had made her a bagel and she kept asking how she'd gotten the bagel and he would tell her and she would say she'd forgotten and they called me to tell me this and to say they were taking her to the hospital and I and they were in England and there was absolutely nothing I could do. I couldn't be there. I couldn't be bothering them because they were having to deal with this terrifying thing. I couldn't be calling them going, ah, I'm sad. Um, and I also found myself unable to leave the house. So I canceled everything I was supposed to be doing for two days. And I curled up on a very old armchair in my grandmother's house. I also couldn't tell my grandmother because we didn't want to worry her. Um, and I pretty much spent two days going, who would I be without this person? Um, and being incredibly freaked out and sad. I did not begin writing a novel. Um, and then some time passed and I got a call and they said, it's okay, it's TGA, which has stroke-like symptoms, but you recover from it completely. And she's fine now, she knows who she is. She proofread this many, many, many times. Um, but um, it, I started thinking, who would I be if my mother had left? Because there were times when my mother had said when I was growing up, I, I'm leaving, I'm going back to New York. You and your father can survive without me, useless creatures. Um, and she didn't mean it, but it sort of, I thought, well, what if she had? Because she had to give up a lot to take care of us, as I think many women do. Um, and so I sort of started thinking about this character who wasn't evil, but who leaves her child and why that happened. And this character who very much isn't my not mother came into being. Um, and there's a small part of that that is also, I am mixed race, as you heard, and a lot of my relationship to my Japanese and Chinese side comes through my mother, and if she hadn't been around, I would have had a much harder time negotiating that. So Jay, who you heard a little bit from in the beginning, is an art dealer, but he refuses to deal Japanese art because he's so angry with his mother. Um, and so the book deals with a little bit of those ideas as well. How have your, you've mentioned that your mother's proofread the book several times, but how, what were their reactions, the rest of your family, your grandparents, your father? Um, my father is very worried. He, um, <laughs> he was going, is it being an author a real job? And I keep telling him, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's a real job, we'll see. Um, but he's very proud of me, despite that. Um, and my grandmother is equally bemused, I think, but um, quite, quite pleased. Although the Guardian asked me to interview her and she did not understand this. She kept going, I'm not Japanese, I'm Chinese. Do they know that? And I kept going, yes, they do know it. It's okay, I'm not going to pretend you're Japanese. Don't worry. Um, and so I think be pleased bemusement is how I would describe most of my family's reaction. That sounds pretty he pretty healthy in between. <laughs> I'm sure that they will become more and more approving. Um, uh, what about the idea for the two simultaneous narratives? How did that come to you? Oh, I think there were always two simultaneous narratives. Um, I... Although Jay was once very different. Originally, it was sort of their lives parallel. So, you know, be her when she was a teenager, him when he was a teenager. Um... And then I realized that his sections take place just after he's had a child and he's thinking about what it means to be a parent and that it needed that moment of urgency in his life because she leaves when he's very, very young, which you know from the beginning of the book, so that's not a spoiler, don't worry. So I felt that if I'd started writing about him when he was 15 or 16, his main concerns actually, although that might be an underlying feeling, would not be about that and it would have felt very for false to force it upon him so it ended up being sort of about him when he got a bit older so but yes there were always two narratives i don't know why there were always two narratives i just knew that there were it felt right yeah yeah um could you talk to us a little about your choice of the title harmless like you which is yeah comes from yuki's lover yeah. lou but i'm wondering for you the what the nature of harm and harmlessness means in general so I have a really weird obsession with the word harmless, um, basically because it's very confusing. Because if someone came up to you and said, you're harmful, you'd be sad and go, why? What did I do? Have I hurt you? What, what's wrong? It's not a good thing to be called harmful. But equally, if someone came up to you and said, oh, you're harmless, your reaction's rage. It's like, 
screw you. Um, and so there's, I started thinking about this sort of, on one level, we don't want to hurt people, but we also don't want to be unable to because harmlessness begins to feel very much like powerlessness. And so in the beginning of the book, this character, um, Yuki feels quite powerless and her feelings about that change. But I also was quite sort of skipping around a bit interested in the fact that every time I saw someone hurting someone else, it was very rarely because they felt powerful. It was always because they felt frightened and scared. And this book doesn't is a pretty focused on the characters, but it does touch on the Vietnam War. And a lot of the speech around that in American American politics wasn't where America was super powerful. It was where America and we there's this huge scary danger that is communism. And, you know, that's where a lot of aggression comes from. And so I was sort of curious about how that manifested in a personal way as well. How it's when we feel the least powerful that we can end up doing the greatest harm, I think. Very much. You 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 many of your characters, if not most of them, are crippled by what's passed down to them um, and the, the inherited patterns that are really difficult to shake. Um, Yuki is abused by Lou, she ends up being violent towards Edison, Yuki abandons Jay, who turn is difficult, t t difficulty in his role as father, etc. Mm -hmm. So there's this kind of perpetuating pattern. Um, I'm wondering if you think that, that pain just shape shifts from one generation to another or is it possible to eliminate its traces, uh, to break patterns. Ultimately, it feels quite hopeful for me by the end of the book, but if you could talk to me a little bit or us about that in general. I mean, you know, I, in my understanding of the world, my experience of the world, it's almost impossible to avoid certain pains being passed down to us by our families, by our history, by world history, but at the same time, we can choose what we do with that pain. We can choose how we'll behave. And I think, um, I don't you know, I don't want to give away too much of the ending of the book, but both characters do try to choose the paths that they think will be the least harmful. They do try to make it better. And that is more or less successful depending on what you, how you feel about it. But I think that that is maybe the best we can do. And hopefully at least work some of the time. Your characters um, are very, e I'm particularly impressed by the way you got into the skin of your male character, Jay. Um, did you have any specific role models in mind? I mean, it's just so not who you are. It's kind of astounding that you managed to depict him so well. I don't know if you have a brother or an uncle or someone that you're close to. I do have a brother who I'm quite close to, although he'd be quite cross if I told him <laughs> that he was Jay, I think. Um, well, actually, it's really interesting that you ask that because I tend to think that my characters are always inevitably a little bit me, every single one of them, and inevitably little bits and pieces and gestures stolen from people I know, and then bits from who knows where. Um, I guess that's the imagination part. Um, and I'm always surprised that people are surprised about Jay because Yuki, Jay's only a little bit older than I am. He's mostly, he, he's almost my contemporary. Um, we're both mixed race. He um, was, you know, he's probably shares a lot more of my biography. I mean, I ended up, I'm going to do it again. I m mistakenly came out to El Canada, but they were uh, they asked me this question. I said, oh, and he's bisexual, and I'm bisexual. And then I was like, I've just told a <laughs> national newspaper, cool, fine, <laughs> moving on. Um, but there, <laughs> so I feel like, at least in my experience of it, although Jay has some traits that I really, I'm trying to avoid, I'm trying to be a good person, um, and Jay's quite grumpy. Um, <laughs> but I think there's a little bit of me and all my characters. Mm -hmm. I hope that's not too egocentric. It's just, you know, a way of empathizing. Um, the character of Celeste, I think, is absolutely brilliant. Jay's bald cat, who plays a much, much bigger role than, than is expected, not only in deepening our understanding of Jay, uh, but also a crucial role in the plot at the end, etc. And how did you find her and what gave you the idea to use a cat in this way? where she becomes so integral into the plot. 
Okay, so Jay has a therapy cat, a bold therapy cat. And this sort of came about in two ways. The, the craft-based reason, or the sort of, is that he has a lot of trouble expressing love and I wanted to give him something he could express love for. And the strange thing that he can express love for is this bold cat, who, which his wife hates. Um, that he gets given and it's sort of aging and she really wants him to put down the cat and he really doesn't want to put down the cat. Um, and this is a problem in their marriage. Um, the my life reason for this cat is that I was living in the Midwest, which was a very unfamiliar place for me. Um, I'd grown up in the UK and I'd lived in New York and I'd not really expe expecting to move to Wisconsin. And someone a friend of mine drove me to walmart for i think possibly the first time i could be wrong i might have been taken there once a long time before but in my i had no understanding of how walmart works walmart is very 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 big and i lost my friend um so i was wandering the aisles of walmart thinking oh my goodness am i gonna have to ask them to page say like please pick up your useless person at the information desk um and I sort of turned the corner of an aisle and I saw this vision of this um, very large gentleman holding this tiny dog. It was a tiny little white dog that was slightly balding. It like the, the bits of fur come off him wearing a bright neon yellow jacket. Um, it said therapy animal on it. And I was fascinated. I was just fascinated. I was like, what is this? What's going on? Um, my friend found me, I got taken home to Google, and I started looking up therapy animals. And actually, you know, as much as I joke about it, it's a wonderful thing. So many people derive so much comfort from the animals in their lives. And actually medical sort of science thought, oh, maybe that's a thing. Maybe that can be a thing that helps people deal with trauma, deal with depression, um, a whole bunch of things therapy animals can help people deal with. And once I found that out, it just felt right. Um, and I think if I'd made Celeste not a bold cat and an instead an adorable white fluffy kitten, then I would never have been allowed to say anything else about any of the other characters ever again. And I would ju because people would only have wanted to talk about this cute kitten, so I had to make Celeste a little bit weird, I think. <laughs> you did a very good <laughs> job. Um, could you tell us a little more about the chapter headings in the Yuki section? Um, okay. Sections, so as it goes along. <laughs> okay, so um, every single one of Yuki sections starts with a year and with a color. Um, and that's partially because you, perceptive people, probably notice that Jay speaks in the first person. And he does a lot of explaining of himself and justifying of himself. Um, some of it's more or less true. Um, but Yuki is not as... She doesn't have anyone to talk to for a lot of the book, and she therefore doesn't really articulate her thoughts in the same way and she's a very visual person and I wanted to talk about her emotions in a way that she would feel was true and the way that she would experience um, and so for each chapter I titled it with a color and I sort of sent this to my editor and my editor said these are great but like no one knows what Queen of Crydone gold is other than you Rowan and you just really like the way that sounds um, and so I started writing these little descriptions that initially were just supposed to sort of tell you what the color looked like physically, because I love paint color names, but in became the emotional palette for each chapter. Um, so yeah, and in fact, I, in the, I slightly alter my readings for when I'm reading to you people, because I don't want you to be confused too much, but they're actually, you've gradually realized that the only part of Yuki's sections that are in the first person are the color sections, but I didn't didn't want to make that too confusing right now, although I've now just told you, so. <laughs> was, was this a book which came easily to you, or was it a huge struggle? What is the process of writing like for you? I mean, Pleasure or torture? <laughs> It's one of those things which, yes, there were definitely days where I wanted to lie down on my floor and cry and say, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Where did this hubris come from? At the same time, obviously, writing a novel is something you do from joy because you love it, because you love writing, because you love stories. It is not building roads or walls, and it would be, you know, 
it may have felt hard for me, but there are many harder things in this world. Um, but yeah, the, it definitely, it took me about a year to write a first draft and about two years to edit it. And to spend two years finding everything that you've done wrong in an eight, in 80,000 words it can get you down at times. Um, but I was very lucky and I have a very lovely agent and a very lovely editor and they helped me and... Should I tell them the lightning story? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, she told me there were stories she wanted me to tell. And I was like, wait, you want me to tell them the lightning story? Um, so I was living in a... Well, I was awarded a writing residency in a barn in upstate New York that used to belong to a poet called Ed Edna St. Vincent Millay. So it's very literary. Um, and my agent had given me her notes. And I'd done that delightful thing where I used someone else's printing budget to print out all of the book and annotate it and strike through it and everything else. Um, and I was in the process of typing it up and it was summer, but it was this weirdly stormy summer. Um, and that night it was started raining, there was howling outside. I, it turned out that there were coyotes in upstate New York, which I didn't know until then. Um, and you know, it was storming, thundering. And um, so I just put in my headphones, said, I'm going to focus. I'm going to pay attention to this. This is silly. Um, and then sort of as I was writing, suddenly my vision went white. And I had this incredible pain in the side of my face. Um, and I, you know, I, I blinked and I shook and I was confused. And then my friend or co colleague um, came in and was like, oh my god, lightning hit the barn. And what had happened was, was that lightning had gone, hit the fuse box of the barn, blown out the fuse box, and shot through all of the electricity in the barn. So one of the residents' phone chargers got fried, another friend's laptop charger got fried, and because my computer was plugged into the wall, and my headphones were plugged into the computer and my face, a very tiny amount of the lightning had <laughs> um, shot up into my face and that was what caused me this blinding pain, um, which then continued in my back for two days. Um, and I did that delightful thing that children do when I called home and I said, I got hit by lightning and my mother said, go to the hospital. And I said, no, I have to finish editing this book. Now that I've made you worried, I don't have to be worried anymore because that's how worry works. Um, and it was fine, but I always felt like, because I had been doing a very poor job of backing up, this uh, being struck by lightning slightly had stopped my computer being fried, in my mind, because I had been the grounding of, of the electricity, and so I was always very grateful, so that was probably the most physically painful part of editing this novel. <laughs> How about the research for, um... New York in the 60s and 70s. How did you go about doing that? Okay, so as I said, Yuki is not my mother, but I did cheat slightly. I made her the identical age. And my mother did grow up in New York. Um, so I had a lot of family stories about that time. And it was very interesting because this is a time that is written about quite a lot. It's in quite a lot of movies. But there was not really anyone like my family. You know, the most... Asian person I knew of that time was yellow face and breakfast at Tiffany's which isn't you know the best <laughs> best feeling um, and so I wanted to put a family that wasn't my family but that was like my family into that city at that time and so I you know I had all of this stuff um, but of course you know you had to I, I found myself going back and going wait did this happen then what order was this like when were you wearing fashion like that so that was that was fun. I also looked at a lot of um, old magazines. I had briefly interned at Harper's Bazaar in New York, which mostly consisted of me wearing very uncomfortable shoes and having to restack old magazines. Um, but that meant that I had spent a lot of time with Harper's Bazaar from the, the 1970s, which was sort of floating around in my mind as well. And then, so I sort of wrote this all up and then I found myself going, okay, yeah, but I don't know what Chinatown looks like. So going into old photo archives and finding these incredibly beautiful photographs. I, I didn't know they sold wigs in Chinatown at that time. I didn't, um, there was this one, my favorite was probably this photograph of these mothers in this playground that I'd walked past many times. 
and it's the 60s, but they've done themselves up as sort of like perfect 1950s women. Like they're wearing white gloves and they have perfectly permed hair and they are so proud of how beautiful they look and they do look that beautiful. And so I found myself building into the city and then again, you know, in that editing process, you then have fact checking and copying. And I found out that there were things I didn't even realize would be different. Like um, I showed it to someone who went, oh no, she's in a diner, she wouldn't be eating penne. And I said she was eating penne because penne's boring in my mind. You know, I grow up eating penne all the time. And they were like, no, maybe if this was a really fancy Italian restaurant, they'd have penne. But like never in a diner at that time, penne was exotic. And so I thought, oh, okay. And so it's, it's macaroni and cheese um, now in, in the book. Um, so it was definitely a process where I thought I understood about a time, but it actually required all of those years of writing and learning and resorting it in my mind. You've directed a short film. <laughs> I'm wondering if you have um, plans or ambitions to work with this in any way and in, into turning it to a film. I currently don't, but if anyone in the world wants to turn to movie, I will be very pleased. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask the audience um, if anyone wants to ask questions. You're all welcome. It don't bite, promise. <laughs> what are you going to do with your PhD? Are you going to teach, or do you have an idea? Um, well, I have taught writing in the past, and I hope to continue doing it, so doing the PhD is quite nice for that, um, and also I'm using this time to work on a second novel, because you have to find the time to do that, and I'd started the PhD before I learned that this would make it into the world, and I thought, well, if the first one doesn't, this will get me a little bit more time alone in a room with a computer to write another one, and... It got born, but then I still have to write a second book, so I'm doing that. Any more? Hi. Um, I'm wondering what kind of reaction you've received in this perception of motherhood, because I think in our society we have pretty strict ideas of how women should feel about mothering and what it means to be a mother. Um, so I... It's one of those things where usually if people come up to you and speak to you, they say, they're saying nice things. I have no idea what they're saying angrily in their book clubs. Um, but to me personally, actually, the thing that was incredibly, incredibly moving to me is I went to talk to a books club in um, Ipswich, which is sort of somewhere in England, um, and this woman who works with mothers who have postpartum depression um, came up to me and she said, you did a really good job, you know, I felt that this felt very true and you cared about her and I was, I almost cried <laughs> um, because I did want to write about a mother who was struggling but I didn't want to make that woman seem inhuman or evil because I, I, if fiction can be morally iffy, I think it's when you start painting people as evil. What do you do to get your creative juices flowing? Like if you just hit a wall, do you go to a certain place? Do you drink a favorite beverage? What do you do? Um, so I try to switch up where I am. Um, so for me, I really like it helps to just like go on a walk, go outside, go, you know, go to a different room, go to my friend's house, go just be in a different space. And I find that my brain rejigs itself. Also reading. I tend to tell myself, oh, you have to spend this time either writing or reading. You're not allowed to be on Facebook or on MSN Messenger. But if I sit there just being mad at myself for being bad at writing, then I don't do good writing. So I have reading beautiful things as the other thing that I do because I tend to find that once you see someone else doing something beautiful, you're like, wait, I want to try doing something like that. And even if it turns out that that was Sylvia Plath and you're probably not going to be Sylvia Plath, you know, if, if that's enough to get you started, it, it helps for me, at least. Do you have a particular, I'm being greedy and just piping in on the question front, do you have a particular um, style master that you feel very inspired by or does it change? I think for me it changes. Um, there are definitely writers, you know, who I think are really brilliant and talented and who've inspired me in different ways. Um, I 
had, I think when I was quite young, someone once, I can't even remember who it was, um, was, we were just talking about influence and was saying, well, yes, if you only read one person, then yes, you may sound like a pastiche of them. But if you read widely, if you read widely and love widely and think about whatever, what things are doing strongly, then eventually stealing all of those tiny bits will be your style. It won't be a pastiche of someone else. And I try to do that. I try to take work as it comes. Like sometimes I read murder mysteries. Some of those are well written. Some of them are not, but they're usually very good at plot. Um, you know, and I read poetry, even though I don't write poetry and I try to find, you know, I don't like everything. There are some things I don't like, but you know, I, when I can, I try to find what's working and what's exciting and to learn from it. Can I ask one? <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to jump in. Um, from from listening to you talk and like with your with your accent, is you have this kind of very sort of transatlantic, sometimes British, sometimes American twang. And I was just wondering, in in writing a book, say for example, set in New York, was there any moment where you had to kind of stop the British side of your vocabulary, uh, sort of influencing the way people sp speak or the words they used, or was it just something were you quite naturally able to separate the two vocabularies? The greatest plague of my life is Britishisms and Americanisms. I do not know which is which at all. Um, and so I, I do, because I, you know, I have spent quite a bit of time in America. I can think of like, I don't put British things in American scenes, but I put British expressions, British word choices. Um, and so I do have to ask my British friends to read. I'm working on a novel at the moment, which is set in England. I asked my British friends to read this. I'm like, this is an Americanism, is it? And this, I had a lot of Americans read it. And they were like, what words are you using? What phrases are these? Where did they come from? And I had to be like, oh, I, I can't use that. I'm really sad now. Um, although the one thing I did learn is that it turns out Americans are not entirely... They don't all agree about what's a Britishism and an Americanism. I think I said someone was drenched, and somebody told me that no American would ever say drenched. And someone else was like, no, Americans say drenched all the time. I can't remember if I kept it. Um, in those cases, I just do what I want. Um, but yes, no, it is, it is difficult. The other thing that's very odd is that I think largely in my casual conversation, I lean towards sounding a bit American, even though weirdly I'd quite like to stay sounding British because it impresses Americans and it would make me seem much more serious. Um, but then when I read from this very American book where I'm trying to sound like validly American, my reading voice is quite British. So I don't know. My mouth is working against me, perhaps. How's your ch Japanese or Chinese? My Chinese is sadly terrible and my Japanese is not very good, but I try. <laughs> um, my mother, when I was growing up, was very concerned that I would be confused. She has, her father spoke to her in Japanese when she was young and she always felt inadequate, even though she is now therefore pretty fluent. Um, but she was like, I didn't want to confuse you or make you sad. So we didn't, so apart from particular expressions, we didn't speak a lot of Japanese. We had a lot of Japanese food. We had a lot of Japanese cultural habits, um, traditions at home, but we didn't speak. And so I studied Japanese later in college and um, I lived there briefly, but my Japanese is sadly woefully inadequate, as any Japanese person will tell you. Um, and so, yes, but I, I try. Okay, well, I think if no one has any more questions, then we're going to say an enormous thank you to Rowan. And I cannot urge you enough to go and get this brilliant book. It's absolutely outstanding. Um, it's for sale in the bookshop inside and Rowan I'm sure will be delighted to do signings out here and you're all welcome to stay for a glass of wine and we're all dying to read your next book and it's just been an honor to have you with us. Thank you Thank so you. much. Rowan Buchanan.